Good morning. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines. Asian markets are off to a muted start owing to lack of global queues. US markets were shut on Monday on account of a holiday. IMF Chief Economist Geeta Gopinath has said that there is a need to reduce India's consolidated fiscal deficit, which has remained high over the last five years. That's a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. Sanjeev Bajaj of Bajaj FinServe is unsure of when NBFC businesses will return to normalcy, but is certain that the crisis is well and truly over. That's another exclusive from Davos. And oil prices have settled near a two-month high after US drilling activity fell to the lowest since May. And finally, Asian Paints will be reporting its third quarter numbers today. The company's domestic business is likely to report a 12 to 15 percent growth in volumes, according to analysts. Now remember, US markets were shut yesterday on account of Martin Luther King Day, but let's take a look at what's happening in the Asian markets this morning. As of now, it's a bit of a muted start to most of those uh, equity benchmarks in Asia. Uh, the three early risers, of course, the Nikkei in Japan, the Australian benchmark, and also the Gospi had all started lower, but in fact, the Nikkei has bounced back just a little bit. It's currently trading a, a flat. Absolutely flat, in fact. You have the Chinese benchmarks that have opened with narrow cuts, uh, about three-tenths of a percent. And you have the Hang Seng that's currently trading with gains of about uh, one-tenth of a percent. So all around, not the best cues in the morning. And perhaps some of the macroeconomic data, or rather outlook, that has come out overnight has something to do with that. The International Monetary Fund has cut its forecast for the world economy, predicting that it will grow at the weakest pace in three years in 2019. And also, it warned that fresh tra trade tensions would spell further trouble. In its second downgrade in three months, the lender blamed softening demand across across Europe and recent palpitations in financial markets. It predicts that global growth of 3.5% this year, uh, that's weaker than the 3.7% that it projected in October. And besides all of this, there's also political tension and uh, also uh, updates from China. President Xi Jinping has stressed the need to maintain political stability in an unusual meeting of China's top leaders, a fresh sign of the growing concern about the social implications of the country's slowing economy. But let's speak a little more about that IMF forecast. It has reduced, remember, its global economic growth forecast, citing emerging risks in like trade tensions and a no-deal Brexit. Menika Doshi got up with the chief econom uh, economist, uh, Gita Gopinath, uh, in Davos uh, to get an IMS prescription to counter this slowdown and also what they make of the Indian economy ahead of the upcoming elections. Listen in. We've, re we've reduced the forecast for 2019, uh, but it's important to note that the revisions are modest. Uh, and it's being driven in advanced economies. It is being driven by a slowing of growth in the euro area. Within the euro area, it would be Germany and Italy. So that's what it looks like uh, for uh, the advanced economies. What we are more concerned about mm -hmm. are the growing risks to the global economy. Uh, and there are several of those. Some of the important ones are an escalation in trade tensions, a worsening in financial conditions, uh, no deal Brexit, uh, and uh, in the event of a faster than expected slowdown in China, the consequences of that for the global economy would be far more negative than what we have right now. Okay, my next question is a two-part question. Do you believe there is um, enough room, both from a monetary policy point of view as well as from a fiscal stimulus point of view, to counter uh, some of the slowdown that you're referring to? That's one. And the second is you also focused on the impact on financial markets. You said a range of catalyzing events in key systemic economies could spark a broader deterioration in investor sentiment. What is it that you're expecting? Uh, policy space is indeed uh, limited. It is varied across different countries. Uh, there are some countries for which there is abundant policy space, but there are others for which policy space is quite um, tight. Monetary policy has barely normalized in many of the yeah. countries of the world, and so that is a concern. Uh, what we are uh, recommending is that given that growth, while has slowed, is not decline precipitously, we still think that there is some more time left for certain countries to build up buffers, uh, fiscal buffers, uh, and uh, so that in the eventuality that there would be a downturn, 
next time around that they would be better prepared. Okay, and the financial market impact? The financial market impact is a big one uh, for much of 2018 while the trade tensions were ongoing. Uh, it appeared that advanced country financial markets were disconnected from the trade tensions. But recently what's happened post-October is that those two have come together, they become more intertwined. And the risks to, of that are high. Uh, and why is that? It's because we are uh, living at a time when debt, both in the private sector and in the public sector for many countries, is quite high. Yeah. So you've spoken of sovereign yields, you've spoken of corporate bonds in the U.S. What are you watching very, very closely uh, in 2019? Uh, we watch many, many, uh, many different indicators. Uh, we certainly watch what's happening closely in the financial markets in terms of sovereign spreads, uh, in terms of corporate borrowing costs, in terms of market sentiment. There's also been a change in financial market sentiment in terms of uh, a more pessimism about corporate earnings. Uh, a lot of this is going to depend on what happens with the trade uncertainty, with Brexit uncertainty. Uh, so these have to be resolved. Okay. One final question on India. Uh, we're in an election year. The fiscal situ situation is looking a little tough. Do you think India has room for a substantial farm benefit situation? I don't know what to call it. I'm not sure it's a loan waiver. Uh, we're not sure it's going to take some form of a direct benefit scheme or a UBI that people have discussed. Um, what are you looking forward to? Um, oh, we don't speak directly to kind of individual policies that, uh, that countries should follow. Uh, but in the case of India, what uh, we flag is the fact that the overall consolidated de fiscal deficit uh, remains high, and it's been the case for the last five years. So we certainly need to fix that. We need to address that. Uh, GST revenues have not come in at the rate at which it was expected, and so that would be a con an area for continu continued improvement. All right, uh, just an update, minor cuts across the board for Asian markets as of now. Remember, the U.S. markets were shut and that is the perfect place to springboard and to uh, check off uh, the trade setup for the day in India and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Agam Vakil is here to tell you all about that and more. Agam, well, good morning. What's on your list today? Uh, good morning, Alex. Well, again, a lot of earnings, but I'm going to start with the benchmarks right now. Uh, let's take a look at the SJX NFT flat. Uh, so, well, at least as far as the SGX Nifty futures are concerned, they're not uh, moving above the mark of 11,000 at this point. A lot of stiff resistance. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to our markets yesterday, there was some strength, but the broader markets did lag substantially, underperforming the benchmarks. And the Nifty Banking Index, too, well, it did see strength, but this was largely an account of perhaps a handful of names. One of them, of course, would be Kodak Mandela Bank reacting to earnings. The PSU Banking Index did decline by as much as 1.3%. The ADRs, or rather, okay, this the fund flow, of course, uh, we, have, we have about 300 crores outgo, and it's the same for the FIIs too, so watch out for that on a net basis. And uh, we have uh, your contribution from the Nifty, Reliance, Infosys, and HDFC Bank. As I was suggesting, it was essentially uh, HDFC Bank and Kotak Mahindra Bank, which actually helped the banking Nifty upwards. But, uh, uh, the, but something like a Maruti Suzuki Hero Motor Corp actually bearing down on uh, the Nifty. But let's talk about uh, your futures and options skews, and we have about 4% added in open interest towards fresh longs in the nifty futures, the banking nifty futures too. And if we can have that up, uh, has seen an uptick of around 2%. Let's talk about uh, your open interest distribution. This is where things have gotten very interesting now. We have a considerable amount of well, support at the 10,700 and the 10,800 mark, which means it seems unlikely that the Nifty will go much below something like a 10,700 in the near term over the next couple of weeks. On the higher end, well, it seems like uh, the Nifty is ready to take off because uh, we actually don't have too much or at least relatively less OI build up in a lot of these call options. But um, moving on to uh, your change in OI. Yesterday's day of trade was the day when you did see a lot of writing in the 10,900, uh, you know, put. Uh, what is also surprising, and uh, well, increase of open interest around the 11,000 mark, and that could be crucial. We'll be watching out for how things, well, move of keeping that into perspective. Adani Power and Jet Airways remain in the FNO band. Your India Volatility Index uh, has risen 9% to around 18. So, well, some concerns coming through there. But uh, when it comes to your Nifty put call ratio, that's a step higher to around 1.59. Uh, so this is the same for the bank Nifty at around 1.18. And in terms of stocks, so we're keeping an eye on DCB Bank, which, uh, well, did uh, well, 
declined by around one and a half percent. More weakness for uh, Union Bank actually and Vodafone Idea as well, along with Jubilant Foodworks, all looking at fresh shots. And uh, unwinding came through in Kajaria Ceramics, Torrent, uh, you know, Pharma or for that matter, Oracle Financial Services. But uh, it was essentially a day of red for the mid-caps, Alex, and a lot of selling pressure coming through in the future space. So I'm going to be watching out for that. Thanks so much for that, Agam. Well, let's talk about commodities. And in fact, uh, Yash Upadhyay is here to tell you all about that. Yash, oil uh, in focus again this morning. What the updates there? Morning, Alex. So crude oil prices uh, ended the day marginally higher, remaining steady around the two-month two high mark as U.S. drilling, according to data, su suggested that it has slowed down to its lowest levels uh, since May last year, while the ongoing uh, trade talks between the United States and China, they continue to cast an uncertain outlook for demand uh, going forward. Muted cues coming in from the base metal space. Copper prices, they snapped their four-day winning streak uh, after data showed China's economy uh, grew at its lowest pace in a decade in the last quarter. Aluminum prices, they fell close to 1% as well as Chinese output of the metal uh, hit a record high before an end to the uh, Rusal sanctions. Uh, lead, lead prices gained a close to 0.1%. Zinc was up about 0.3%, gaining for a fourth consecutive day. Uh, on the other hand, gold prices, they fell for a, for a third straight day, even as holdings in gold ETFs, uh, they rose to their highest levels uh, since April 2013. Thanks so much for that, Yash. Now let's look at what's making headlines across the globe. Stephen Engel of Bloomberg News brings you the first word headlines. The UK opposition Labour Party is calling for a second vote in Parliament that could trigger another referendum on Brexit. Prime Minister Theresa May is refusing to rule out delaying the split, but is under pressure from a draft bill that could force her to ask Brussels to extend the Brexit deadline. She told the House of Commons there's no justification for a second referendum. It would require an extension of Article 50. We would very likely have to return a new set of MEPs to the European Parliament in May. And I also believe that there has not yet been enough recognition of the way that a second referendum could damage social cohesion by undermining faith in our democracy. The Prime Minister seems to be going through the motions of accepting the results, but in reality is in deep denial. Yeah. The logic of that decisive defeat is that the Prime Minister must change her red lines because her current deal is undeliverable. The UK's looming split from Europe sees two more key markets moving out of London. CME Group is shifting its forwards and swaps venue to Amsterdam. Uh, that foreign exchange sees $15 billion a day, while CBOE Global Markets is also moving most of its European equities trading to the Netherlands. CME and CBOE are both still waiting for regulatory approval from Dutch financial authorities. And PetroChina has brushed off a $1.5 billion write-down from its disposal of some assets, estimating that full-year net income more than doubled last year thanks to higher crude prices. China's biggest oil and gas producer says net income could have jumped as much as 132 percent. That would take it to $7.8 billion for the year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Stephen Engel. This is Bloomberg. And this is Bloomberg Quint. You'll find a lot of those stories on Bloomberg Quint as well. And in fact, a lot more over the course of the day in terms of the live market action and also all the updates on our stock markets. But uh, here are a few stories that if you log on to the website right now, you'll find. First up, Senator Kamala Harris on uh, Monday confirmed that she will be pursuing the Democratic presidential nomination for 2020. Harris is the daughter of Jamaica-born father and an Indian mother, and she would be the first Indian American in the Oval Office if she, of course, ended up winning that election. Life Insurance Corporation of India finally owns a bank uh, despite much debate over the government's decision to cede control of IDBI Bank to the national insurer, the transaction is now close to completion. IDBI Bank, in a statement issued yesterday, said LIC completed the acquisition of a 51% stake, uh, controlling stake rather, in the lender. As such, the bank's board approved the reclassification of LIC as promoters of IDBI Bank.
In India, I think the uh, liquidity squeeze that affected some NBFCs and HFCs is behind us now. Okay. Um, Bajaj Finance has been okay because we follow very okay. prudent practices. But um, the bigger question is to understand why this happened. If it was because of company A or B that could very easily have been addressed um, instead of making this a much larger industry issue, which it wasn't. And that's something that the regulator needs to think about, how to prevent something like this from recurring. Okay, so that's specifically what I wanted to talk to you about, you know. I think the asset liability mismatch, uh, the sort of the limited sources of funding, especially wholesale funding, that the NBFC industry has witnessed, uh, you know, over its sort of three, four, five years of explosive growth. What in that model specifically needs to change if that growth were to return, maybe at a moderated pace, and to sustain? I would say four things. One, risk needs to be priced better. We're going through a period where the public sector banks are not able to lend. Mm -hmm. They're going through their own challenges. Hence, a lo lot of the liquidity went into NBFCs, especially even younger, newer NBFCs. Flushed with this men money, they started lending at rates uh, which didn't really match the risks that they were taking. And it's not just the risk to the customer that you're lending. It's a risk of learning that comes from spending years going through the lending cycle. Sure. So to me that's one. The second is in terms of asset liability matching. Uh, very clearly for any NBFC or for any bank, uh, the closer you match your assets to your liabilities, the less is the chance of getting caught in a liquidity squeeze. And a few HFCs were not, and uh, I think they got caught out over there. Third important thing is, in general, liquidity availability to banks. Uh, we need to see to the larger NBFCs. If you look at the top 10 NBFCs today, each one of them is 10,000 crores assets and above. Bajaj Finance is over 100,000 crores in assets. We are bigger than most banks. Um, it is important to sit down and rather than to think of whether this is an NBFC or a bank license, to try to think about how do you structurally make these 10, 12, 15 NBFCs, not the remaining 7,000, but these 20 of them stronger. Because they are playing a significant role in the economy, but naturally they are systemically big now. Hmm. So that needs to be taken care of. And to me the last major issue over here is why wasn't there a run on the banks uh, four months ago? Hmm. Because there is a certain um, understanding that the banks will always get protected by the RBI. I think a similar understanding is to be there for these big NBFCs. Now what it means, what the details are, those things need to be worked out. We saw it across the world in terms of the amount of confidence that CEOs had, regardless of where they're from, in both the global economy as well as their ability to actually manage through that difficulty and raise revenues over the next 12 months. So what you find is a tremendous amount of optimism from last year that's done a 180. What I mean by that is the pessimism that we had last year was a relatively small number. It's risen almost sixfold in terms of where we are today. Now the level of confidence that we had previously has decreased, not by that much, but it's definitely decreased. So we have a polarization of those that see the positive and the negative. Depending on where you are in the world, that actually um, factors into where you are coming from in the relative basis. So if you're sitting in Brazil, there was actually a lot more upside and positivity, but it's because Brazil was really dealing with some significant challenges last year. If you look at India and the role it plays in the global economy, there's some other challenges there that actually it's come down somewhat as you look to the execution of it. So that confidence and the degree of pessimism is not unfounded. There's an increasing amount of risks around the world, and some of them are pretty profound when you look at the trade issues with China and the U.S. and how they're coming to life. When you look at the government shutdown in the U.S., when you look at the uncertainty and how Brexit's being managed, all these are issues that are of such magnitude that they've added to this level of uncertainty. It's another straw on the camel's back that CEOs are worried about. Public sector lender, Central Bank of India, is seeking to sell about 1,550 crore uh, worth of loans to Bhushan Power and Steel. Uh, now, the sale of these loans are a normal process that banks in, uh, engage with uh, during the last quarter of every financial year, uh, where they seek out uh, asset reconstruction companies or other uh, financial institutions who might be interested in buying these loans, uh, so they may consolidate them under their balance sheet. Uh, th it is interesting because this is the second bank uh, to have sold 
an IBC account uh, or is seeking to sell an IBC account. Uh, remember that last week, uh, State Bank of India had announced that it will sell its entire exposure, about 15,000 odd crore uh, worth of loans uh, to SR Steel, uh, to any uh, interested ARCs or financial institutions in the market. Uh, the SBI is trying to sell those loans be uh, before uh, the next hearing in the case on the 31st of January. Um, similarly, uh, in case of uh, Central Bank of India, the sale of assets is at a significant discount uh, to the actual value of the assets. Remember, uh, for about 1,550 crore worth of loans in Bhushan Power and Steel, uh, the bank is seeking bids for, uh, worth about 700 odd crore uh, from any interested buyer on a full cash basis. Currently, the bank holds about 940 crore worth of provisions against this uh, against uh, Bhushan Power and Steel's loans. So that means that it will be in effect selling it at at a, a discount of about 200 odd crore. Uh, it is interesting to see that bankers are uh, willing to sell uh, these loans at a significant discount, uh, despite uh, some of the uh, uh, cases coming to a conclusion or soon coming to some kind of a resolution under the insolvency and bankruptcy process. Bankers are avoiding any kind of uncertainty and trying to exit uh, these loans uh, at, at even at a discount, uh, so they may continue with the rest of their business without worrying too much about these resolutions. Asian Paints is slated to come out with its Q3 numbers later in the day and, we, and the street is expecting a strong quarter for the company. Uh, revenues are seen growing by nearly 15% to 4,886 crore rupees, uh, driven by a high double-digit growth uh, in the, uh, driven by a high double-digit volume growth in their domestic uh, decorator paints business. Uh, the street is expecting a number anywhere in the range of 12 to 15%, but a number higher than that uh, would be a key positive for the company. EBITDA is seen growing by 9.4% to 975 crore crore rupees. Um, margins, now despite the crude oil prices have come off uh, significantly on a year-on-year -year basis, the average crude oil prices for the third quarter, they continue to remain higher and as a result of which margins uh, could come off a bit. So the street is expecting a number of close to 20%, uh, which would be a 90 basis point uh, contraction over the same period last year. Net profit on the other hand is seen growing by about 11.5% to 619 crore rupees. Uh, that apart, uh, we would be closely watching out for any management comments with respect to the demand outlook uh, in the industrial paint business, the slowdown in the auto sales, uh, that would have an impact. So we'll be watching out for that, as well as the performance of its home improvement business, which is the SSN Sleek, and any management commentary with respect to the price hikes uh, are going forward. Well, a bunch of news that you're tracking this morning. Few numbers. I'm going to start off with HDFC AMC, which has reported a good set of numbers. Revenue seemed to be, uh, revenue has gone up by as much as 2%. A flat top line growth there, but then the net profitability of the company has registered a growth of more than 24% in terms of that's mainly on account of healthy operating performance coming in from the company. EBIT is higher by 21%, and the margins of the company have expanded to 66% as compared to 55%. That's mainly also the profitability is boosted by other income which has grown more than two folds in this particular quarter also the total AUM growth which is up by 12% is higher by the kind of growth that we've seen in the previous quarter which stood as much as 9% Zenza Technologies well uh, the company has reported a weak set of numbers there revenue up by six nine uh, revenue up by 7% for the company the net profitability of the company has declined by more than 40% mainly on account of the decline that we've seen on operational front, margins have contracted to 7.3% as compared to 9.4%. That's mainly on account of transition costs on the large deals that the company had won over the last two quarters. Also, we're looking at L&T Finance Holdings, where the company has reported a good set of numbers. NII is up by 55%, and the net profitability of the company has registered a growth of more than 80%. In terms of news that we're tracking this morning, IDBI Bank, which has been declining, the stock has been declining past two to three odd sessions in trade today. The board has approved to reinitiate divestment process of bank stake in IDBI Federal Insurance. That's one counter that we like to keep an eye out on. Apart from that, UFO movies where NCLT has dismissed an amalgamation scheme of the company with Cube Cinemas and other three entities. Also, we're looking at Prabha Dairy where the company in its exchange filing register that is going to be selling its milk processing business for a consideration of around 1,700 crore. It's going to be selling this to a French group, Indian Arm uh, Thirumala Milk Products, and the sale is expected by the first quarter of the financial year 20.